Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Brandon Camilo, and I'm the face behind the hand that does everything for the Art Cyclopedia videos. I just want to take the time to say that I'm so excited to finally be in front of the camera and I can't wait to make more content for you guys this way. More importantly, if you stick around to the end of the video, I have some important announcements to make with regards to the future of the channel. Anyways, let's hop into the subject matter. As you may have seen from the thumbnail, today's video is about the Grand Canyon. So let's get into it. Alright, so I'm jumping back into a view of my right hand, which is the main reason why I keep the art on the right side for these types of videos. If I was a lefty, I would keep the painting on the other side. Sorry lefties. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. Today we're talking about a somewhere that everyone everywhere knows about. That's right baby, I'm talking about planet Earth's most memorable crevice, the Grand Canyon. This bad boy sports some gnarly stats. Coming in with a maximum depth of well over one mile, a largest width of about 18 miles, and a total length of 277 miles, it's really no wonder why this canyon is so memorable. Although, there is Hell's Canyon in Idaho that's over 2,000 feet deeper. There is also Colca Canyon in Peru that is over 4,000 feet deeper and the Yarlung Sangpo Grand Canyon in Nepal, otherwise known as the Brahmaputra Canyon, that is over 10,000 feet deeper. These will most likely be art cyclopedias in the future, but anyways, regardless of whoever is more hashtag deep, the Grand Canyon receives more than five and a half million visitors per year making it arguably the most popular canyon in the world, and certainly one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Oh, and before I continue, I just want to inform you guys that I won't be doing a list format for this encyclopedia, and probably might stray away from the list format in the future as well, mostly because my brain doesn't work like that. It's honestly a lot easier for me to flow with the ideas as they come, most people that know me IRL know that I kind of just do this stream of consciousness thing with my thoughts. You know, I kind of just go with the flow. And speaking of going with the flow, the Grand Canyon was carved by the flow of the mighty Colorado River. You see what I did there? No, but really though, let me get into some of the history slash documentation of the Grand Canyon. It's no surprise that Native Americans have inhabited the regions in and around the canyon for thousands of years, and have passed down stories of the canyon for generations. The National Park Service recognizes 11 current tribes with historic connections to the Grand Canyon, including five different tribes of Peyu Indians. But the Havasupai, which means people of the blue-green water, are some of the most interesting. You see, their territory is mostly inside Grand Canyon National Park, and the capital of the Havasupai Indian Reservation is in Supai, Arizona, which is an interesting location in the US. This town is in the heart of the Grand Canyon and is only accessible by foot, mule, or helicopter. It's the only place in the US where mail is still delivered by pack mule. If you want to learn a lot more about this tribe, I've linked an interesting video in the description where a tribesman gives more detail about Supai village and tribal stories. Now, in terms of documentation of the canyon, there is an issue in which that Native American knowledge is mostly passed down orally through stories told by elders to be recounted in future generations. Apart from the petroglyphs, which are images carved on rock faces depicting stories, not much has been written about the canyon by natives. You see, the first recorded cases of non-natives visiting the Grand Canyon was in 1540, where Spanish explorers led by Francisco Vasquez de Coronado were moving from Mexico onto Kansas. In that expedition, De Coronado was looking for a convenient way to get people back over to the Gulf of California, which is where the Colorado River ends up. So, he sent Garcia Lopez de Cárdenas on a little side quest to explore the Colorado River. 
here is where the Hopi Indians led the Cardenas squad on a long hike to the peaks of the Grand Canyon and to misconstrue the Spaniards' understanding of the Colorado River. The Hopi successfully made them believe that the Grand Canyon was a barren wasteland with a river that was about six feet wide and thus not worth investing more time exploring. The canyon would go largely unexplored by outsiders for a long time until Joseph Christmas Ives ventured into the canyon in 1857 as first lieutenant of the U.S. Army Corps of Topographical Engineers. He was technically the first white dude to travel the river in the Grand Canyon, but his steamboat crashed before he was actually technically in the Grand Canyon. He did travel by skiff and by foot and made it to Diamond Point where he wrote about how beautiful the canyons were and how majestic their appearance was to the naked eye. However, he then followed the description by writing, The region is of course altogether valueless. It can be approached only from the south and after entering it, there is nothing to do but leave. Ours has been the first and will doubtless be the last party of whites to visit this profitless locality. It seems intended by nature that the Colorado River, along with the greater portion of its lonely and majestic way, shall forever be unvisited and undisturbed. And man, was John Ives wrong. That is wrong. Because in 1869, we enter the world of John Wesley Powell. Who, you may ask? Well, John Wesley Powell, good old JP. I'm gonna call him JP from here on out. This guy's a pretty cool dude. And the more I researched him, the more cool stuff I uncovered. Anyways, homeboy over here is most famous for actually being the first white dude to travel the entirety of the Grand Canyon by way of the Colorado River. Before JP, the Grand Canyon had the nickname of the Great Unknown. Anyway, with rafting through the Grand Canyon, he documented his experience and scientific findings and finally put the Grand Canyon on the map for the rest of the world. As you can tell from previous failures, it really was uncharted territory back then, and JP took his merry band of men and took them on a trip that ended up not being so merry to say the least. You see, the section of the Colorado River that passes through the Grand Canyon is freaking packed with some of the world's most intense rapids, and in 1869, with the backing of the US government, JP took 10 men and 4 wooden boats and set off from Green River, Wyoming, and Boy. these guys were put through the ringer. Watch out, watch out, watch out. Along the way, they lost a boat in the intense rapids, along with crucial supplies. They had to ration stale and rotting food. They battled physical exhaustion and they had to constantly weather the elements. Three dudes from the trip ended up giving up on the trip, thinking that continuing through the rapids would be sure death, and they decided to climb up and out of the canyon. Those three men were never heard from again. Legend has it that JP was warned by the Native Americans not to venture into the canyon, but I never found any definitive evidence on that. The trip took him and his men three months and a ton of mental and physical strain to complete, especially with the fact that, oh yeah, JP only had one arm, but he did the whole trip looking like Jamie Lannister. Yeah, he fought for the North in the Civil War and got his arm blasted by an artillery round. So. He had to get it amputated just below the elbow with no anesthesia. How's that for badass? Anyways, after returning from the trip, he recounted his tales with his old chaps back in Washington, D.C., old chaps of which went on to help him create the National Geographic Association. Oh, hold up, let me say that right. On National Geographic. That's right, JP is the one-armed badass that is also a founder of what is now known as Nat Geo. So, you can think about how this guy suffered for science the next time you want to watch Bear Grylls getting peed on by one of the Spice Girls, or watch Gordon Ramsay eat 
It's like a crispy cockroach. <laughs> Anywho, if you want to know more information about John Wesley Powell, I'll link some interesting videos in the description. Now, before we continue, we're going to do a new thing around here I like to call an art break. So, I'm going to pass the microphone on to me from a different time when I was painting the landscape, and I'll be back in two shakes of a lamb's tail. So I don't know if any of you guys noticed, but I didn't include footage of me working the pre-drawing or any of the line work in this video. The reason is because I got a brand new camera and I didn't actually understand the uh, time-lapse settings that I was using. So the time-lapse ended up actually being around like 10 seconds. I'll post it up right here for you guys to see. But something interesting about the line work for this piece is that I decided to forego my usage of Micron pens which are super reliable felt tip pens used by many artists and actually decided to go with the Speedball Super Black India ink in this little shot glass that I have right here. Um, you know, to go along with that, I ended up using a bamboo nib holder and then zebra nibs. I'm not sure if it's focusing on that, but anyways, uh, using this method with ink and pen uh, took some getting used to but actually after I got the hang of it really quickly I realized that the line control on that is phenomenal unreal and you get some really really deep darks so I decided to do the line work first but yeah I'll let you guys know what I think after using it for a little bit longer as well a few moments later all right guys, so at this point, I've basically laid out the watercolor colors that I'm gonna be working with. I think I'm ready to move on to the next phase, which is my color pencil work. Um, here's some of the watercolor stuff laid around, whatnot. I use a mix of the uh, Winsor Newton travel kit as well as the Artist's Loft travel kit for watercolor. I'm relatively new to the medium. So something like this, honestly, like a Grand Canyon piece, might have been a little bit more than I can chew in the sense of like what I bit off. I'm like, damn, this is a whole landscape, you know? Here's my reference photo. Always have a reference photo, guys. Very important to have a reference photo, no product placement. And um, yeah, that's pretty much that. Uh, I'm gonna move on into the color pencil section and then we'll see where that goes. More moments later. Man, I'll be honest with you guys, this piece is kicking my butt, dude. Um, so I've laid out the color pencil, but the fact that this is a watercolor paper means that everything's gonna be like, if, you, if I zoom in real quick, sorry for the shadow, give me one sec. If I zoom in real quick to where um, some color pencil is, you see how coarse everything looks. And I don't like that too much um, for my pieces. Like the fact that this is the Grand Canyon um, is kind of cool because that's rocks and whatnot. But for things like water, um, you kind of don't want to be getting like, you know, super coarse or anything like that. Of course, like zooming into anyone's artwork, you're always going to find mistakes. But I am glad that I found a rhythm with it. I was able to map out certain shadow areas like over here and stuff like that and over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna color match these mapped areas with their respective watercolor colors because I have some areas brown, like this whole thing's gonna be a brown wash and things like that. It's more blue that I need to add in the corners to then like give it more smoothness or at least hopefully more smoothness um but yeah now back to our scheduled programming for the longest time after the popularization of the grand canyon geologists ventured there to see what stories the rock faces told you see the exposure of the rock faces let geologists basically have an uninterrupted look into how rock layers stacked on top of one another it was discovered that the northern part of arizona had around eight different periods of being completely underwater over hundreds of millions of years. It's estimated that the last time the Grand Canyon was under the sea was around 80 million years ago. Each period of water delivered different types of debris, which eventually made up the rock layers of the canyon. 
Then, tectonic movements in the Earth's crust cause some serious uplift. I won't bore you with the extensive details, but the specific event that created the Canyon Plateau is called the Laramide Orogeny. You can look it up if you want to, however, this doesn't explain why the rocks of the Grand Canyon are so red. The reason for that is because most of the rock layers contain particles of iron, and over the course of time what does iron do? It rusts, giving the canyon their distinctive red color. That's right you belligerent bumblebees, the Grand Canyon is really an iron giant. So this explains how the layers of rock look the way they do, but how exactly was it created? Well hold on to your nipples cause I've got you covered. You see, the prevailing theory for the creation has always been that it was carved from the Colorado River, duh. But where did the Colorado River begin? Ah, yes, it's here where geologists of yesteryear had agreed that the point of origin for the Colorado River began around 55 million years ago in a place called Hindu Canyon, which is an ancient riverbed located near the Grand Canyon. However, in 1969, Dr. Richard Young, then a grad student, discovered that the rocks of Hindu Canyon were weathered facing a direction opposite of the Grand Canyon. In other words, the river that used to be Hindu Canyon never actually flowed to the Grand Canyon and thus is not the origin point of the Grand Canyon nor the Colorado River. So, geologists went wild after Young's discovery, and the race was on to find the true origin of the Grand Canyon. This search led geologists to Lake Mead, Arizona, located at the end of the Grand Canyon. Here, geologists discovered limestone layers, which can only be created from the calcium in the shells of little water creatures that died many years ago, which, when you think about it, that means that limestone layers are really just giant graveyards. Anywho, analysis of the Lake Mead limestone showed that the critters stopped living in the lake around 5.5 million years ago due to silt deposits which disrupted their habitat. And you know what deposits silt like a profanity. The Colorado River does. Long story short, the Colorado River was discovered to be only 5.5 million years old which is pretty young by geological standards. Okay, so we have a disproven theory. We have the age of the Colorado River, but we still don't have an actual origin point for the events of all of this. And this is where we enter the findings of Dr. John Douglas, which is the third John that I'm talking about in this video. Anyways, this dude proposed a radical yet simple theory to the origin of the Grand Canyon called the spillover theory. He hypothesized that there had to have been a giant lake somewhere near the Grand Canyon, a lake so large that eventually it overflowed and spilled over into the land, creating a large waterfall that carved the canyon, kind of like what Niagara Falls is doing today. Anywho, this hypothesis leads to a location called Lake Bidahochi, also known as Lake Hopi which is located near the beginning of the Grand Canyon. Here, Douglas found green clay deposits, which means that the lake was deep as flagellum. Oh, he also found the remnants for freshwater mollusks dating back to 6 million years ago, putting the lake at the right place and the right time for the creation of the Grand Canyon. Through further analysis, Homeboy found out that Lake Bidahochi was at one point bigger than Lake Michigan. So, with the elevation difference, the age, and the flow of water, the John Douglas spillover theory became the accepted theory for the origin of the Grand Canyon. However, you have to take geological theories with a pinch of salt, because we will never know the actual truth unless we build a time machine and go back to see for ourselves. And thus, in 2012, Dr. Bill Dickinson proposed a rebuttal to the spillover theory, claiming that Lake Bidahochi was not as deep as Douglas claims it was. Unfortunately, Dickinson has since passed away, but the debate continues on to this day. Honestly, much like the creation of the canyon, a conclusion to its creation may not ever be reached in our lifetime.
And this is the beauty and sadness of geological studies, in my opinion. And this is where my research ends. I could have kept going, but my brain was starting to hurt. I can really see why people dedicate their lives to researching the canyon, and there is so much to uncover at each turn of the river. I honestly didn't even cover the Egyptian artifact conspiracy theories, but that'll be for another time. Or not. Who knows? Anyways. This painting here was honestly my first full-size landscape painting, and I'm not the most content with it to be quite honest. For starters, I did a landscape painting and framed it in portrait dimensions, but I wanted to capture some more height. But hey, in order to get good at something, you have to start by sucking at it, and I'm very glad I started. This art cyclopedia was inspired by a trip that I took with some friends to none other than the Grand Canyon itself. We also went to a bunch of other national parks including Bryce Canyon and Zion National Park. Here are a couple clips from that. But in all seriousness, the Grand Canyon is one of those places that I definitely recommend you go visit and see with your own eyes because cameras just don't do it justice. Me and my friends actually had a hard time being able to discern whether or not it was real what we were looking at because it just feels so unimaginably large when you're actually there. So definitely check that out, put it in your bucket list if you can. It's one of those natural wonders that will be well worth your time. Well, there you have it guys. That's all I have on the Grand Canyon. Let me know what was your favorite bit of information in the comments down below. Also, let me know if there's any interesting facts in the Grand Canyon that I may have missed. I left a lot of the wildlife out to be able to do future art cyclopedia videos on specific animals. Anyways, this painting gave me a run for my money. I give mad respect to all landscape artists out there because it's not easy to capture the grandeur of a location, especially when you're looking at it from a photograph. Although I'm not happiest with the outcome of this piece, I definitely look forward to doing more landscape projects in the future because I will No, but in all seriousness, I do want to improve my skills and it's kind of exciting to start somewhere and then see where I'm gonna go or the potential that someone has to grow. If you want to see this full piece, give me a follow on Instagram at Brandon Camilo Art. Now, it's time for the announcement. And I know you want to hear it at this point because you've stuck around to this part. Or you may have skipped to this section, whatever. I'm excited to announce that I'll be moving into a brand new art studio in the coming weeks. I'm gonna have more space, so I'm gonna be doing projects that are a bit bigger than the things I've been doing for Art Cyclopedia. Also, I wanna open it up to more vlog style shooting and things like that, so I'll be painting all sorts of random things. Anyways, stay tuned for that. Apart from that, that's all I have for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, it really means the world to me. With that being said, I'm Brandon Camilo, your favorite internet artist, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.